All right. Um, so this is a super special episode. I'm here uh, with uh, Jeanette Bedard, which um, Jeanette, you've been on the podcast before and are a member of the Dialogue Doctor community. And uh, Jeanette is here because we're both uh, going to fanboy fangirl out over having Angela Ackerman on the on the the podcast today. Uh, Angela is a conference speaker, a writing coach, an author, um, a creator of amazing virtual tools, um, uh, inventor of the th th writer's thesauruses, which is incredible. Um, so yeah, Angela, and I just, so the, the reason Angela asked you to come on the podcast, because, uh, you know, typically this is a podcast about dialogue, but I ask you to come on because I am obsessed with your emotional thesaurus. Uh, somebody gave it to me. Uh, uh, yeah, Jeanette is as well. Um, somebody gave it to me a year ago, and it has become my. Um, it's like my heroin. Like I can't. I can't write anymore without it. Uh, I have to like have it next to me at all times. Um, so it's it's such an amazing amazing resource so I just wanted you to come on and I wanted a this is just my dirty excuse to meet you uh, uh, and two thank you uh just to kind of talk about these amazing resources you've created and um let everyone else know because I find your resources incredibly helpful for building characterization and for writing dialogue all those things that we talk about um so to start I would love to know a little bit about you and how you got into writing coaching and um, how you got to where you are now. Um, well, it's, it's kind of weird. This is not, this whole career path has been unintended in the sense that, you know, I started writing just like everyone else where, you know, I, I wanted to write fiction and, you know, I knew that I needed to improve. I joined a writer's group you know, I was working on my fiction, I got an agent, you know, it, my stuff went on submission. And while all of this was happening, you know, I was really getting involved in the writing community and meeting other writers, and we would talk about our struggles. And one of our biggest struggles is emotion, as you guys can relate to, you know, how can we show emotion without a characters always rolling their eyes or always shrugging or frowning. And it was just, making our writing so hard because it just made it so bland. And we knew that there had to be a better way to sort of brainstorm all these different ways that you can actually show motion. And so the writers group that I was part of at that time, it's called the critique circle. Um, I met Becca there, who's my co-author of all the thesaurus books and her and I have one stop for writers and writers helping writers together. And uh, we met there and we were talking this over and uh, we started creating these lists. Becca had originally, you know, kind of started doing it on her own. And so we, we started collaborating on these different lists and coming up with, um, you know, all the different things that you think you, your body, the way your um, body reacts to emotion, those visceral sensations, all the body language, the dialogue cues, all the different things that happen for each and every emotion. And it just kind of took off, like right. So many writers, we started blogging these lists and so many writers, they had the same struggle. And so that's kind of when we realized, holy cow, like we thought we had issues in this area, but really it's kind of a universal thing. And so that sort of kickstarted everything for us where we just kept doing different emotions every week. And, and um, you know, we were blogging these originally. Lots of people would come to the site to, um, you know, find out what emotion that we did. And then after we kind of exhausted that, we moved on to other topics of description where people just really struggle with the whole show to tell aspect of it, because that's really what emotion is, is we want to make sure that it's really, you know, it's making readers feel something it's, it's pulling at them. And to do that, you have to write your emotion in a certain way. You can't just use the emotion words. You can't just tell it. And so, um, you know, we just wanted to kind of take that idea of how can we really help writers understand what show don't tell is, so that every word that's going into their manuscript is as powerful as it can be. So every piece of description is as powerful as it can be. And it's working hard to push the story forward. It's not just there to paint a picture, it's actually doing more. And so we started you know, on settings and we would look at all the sensory detail that you would find in any given setting, um, look at the different conflict options that you would find at different settings, just to kind of, again, create sort of a brainstorming tool for people so that 
you know, when they, okay, well, I have to write about, I'm going to have this scene happen, you know, in my, my character's backyard, what's that going to look like, you know, depending on the season, the time of day, you know, what are they going to experience in the backyard and, and what could happen? What could, could go wrong? How could I incorporate that into my story? And so we literally just started looking at different aspects of, um, you know, description, everything from personality traits to the settings, emotions, symbolism, uh, kind of you name it, we've, we've, we've gone through it. And we've done a lot more to sources than actually our books. Like, I think we have, I think we're on number 16 now or something like that. Uh, just all kinds of, yeah, it's just so much fun to explore these things. That's so awesome. I only have six. I'll have to go look at the other ones. Oh, well, they're not all, they're not all books. Uh, they're, they're all at One Stop for Writers, which is kind of like our, it's our online database where everything is, is together. Most of them are there. Some of them are just being completed. So they're not quite there yet, but yeah, that's very it's cool. fun. Jeanette, which one's your favorite? Oh, the emotional thesaurus. I, yeah. I rely on it heavily because uh, I draft very light. And so when I go back in and want to add in the emotion, I rely on it heavily to for brainstorming purposes. Good, 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 good. That's awesome. That's good. Is it heroin for you too? Or is that just a Jeff thing? Uh, I don't think it's actually, <laughs> I wouldn't go to the heroin extent. Um, <laughs> really it's, it's well <laughs> worn. Oh, that was, sorry yeah. that was just so funny i've never no, heard anyone great. say that so yeah, yeah yeah that's um most things that come out of my mouth are just jeff things um yeah so i my favorite one is the emotion the source too um now y'all i haven't seen other list books like this were y'all working off of something or were, was this kind of the, were y'all kind of the first ones to come up with this kind of list book type format um if there were other list books out there, I certainly didn't know of them. Um, when we published the Emotion to Source, the original, um, the one that Jeanette has, it was 2012. And back then, um, self-publishing was still very, very new. And there was a lot of, you know, the traditional kind of look down on it and whatnot. And these are all, you know, uh, self-published books. And one of the reasons why we decided to self-publish is because I thought that, the format is something that would be challenging for the traditional market because this is not a book in the tradition it's not a writing guide in the traditional sense it's part writing guide and part tool and i looked and i didn't really see anything like that out there so if there was something i don't know about it now though there's a lot of different books out there that are made of lists because i think people really understand that you know having that list to brainstorm it really does you know it gets you going again, instead of getting stopped and you're stuck and you're trying to find the right word or the right description. And your, you know, your, your time that you've allotted to writing is just kind of ticking away. You know, you can just look at these lists, come up with an idea that works for that particular character or that particular scene, and then get right back to writing. And so we're just a lot more productive, I think, when we can use these brainstorming tools. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I love how you have them organized by um, like for the emotional thesaurus is the one I'm thinking of specifically each like I guess mini chapter is a different emotion and then you've got definition physical signs and behaviors internal sensations mental responses all the way through and more like it goes on I'm not going to just read through the book but um, it's just a fantastic resource uh, for me because I know when I'm writing I'll be like well before I started using this all of my characters had the same physical reaction. So like everyone that was sad was like, had the knot in their throat and was like tearing up. And everyone that was scared was like, mm -hmm. you know, kind of panicking a little bit, um, having this anxiety rush and really like using the, uh, the physical signs that I felt of emotion and just applying them across characters, which made all of my characters very um, kind of one note. Mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. they're so, and just kind of struggling to like under so what i love about the way that the sources work is that list format allows me just to scan it and be like okay this emotion like this physical sign of this emotion really lines up with this character's personality right like mm -hmm. this is how i can imagine this character would depict that and it just adds to the variety of my characters which i think is um they're yeah, really great i saw you have an occupation thesaurus. Would you mind talking about that one a little bit? Because I find I, I'm going to go buy it. I haven't bought it yet, but I, I find one. it really interesting. You have that yeah. one, Jeanette? I don't know. I don't. Oh, okay. That's, 
that's the last one that we wrote on occupations and occup like it's whenever we research a topic it's so fascinating how interconnected everything is and how everything can be used to do more for your story and jobs are a great example of that people don't just in real life, we don't choose random jobs. You know, we don't just decide one day that we're going to do blah, you know, there's always a reason for it. it. Even if it's something that we don't really want to do, it's because we have bills to pay. We have family to take care of. You know, it's the only job in our area. Um, it's something that allows us to work a certain set of hours so that we can be home with the kids. Like there's always reasons for why we pick a job. And so when you apply this to characters, it really becomes like this, super tool of a way to convey characterization to readers in a really um, realistic and um, word conscious way. So if you think about who your character is and you think about their personality uh, skills, uh, different talents that they have, different belief systems, morals, work ethic, all of that stuff is gonna play into the type of job that they choose and how they perform at that job. And as people, we generally, you know, we make associations all the time. And we make associations when someone tells us what they do for a living. Um, if Jeanette, I overheard before that you were your, your instructor, your, you teach at university, I'm correct? A researcher. I'm a researcher. A researcher, okay. So a teacher is like a really good example. You know, if I said a character was a teacher, immediately the reader's gonna start building um, an idea of what that looks like. Before I've even said anything about who they are or their personality or anything like that, you're immediately, you know, let's say it was a kindergarten teacher. You're gonna be thinking, okay, well, this character is caring. They, they like, they're an advocate for education for kids. Um, you know, they're dedicated, they're hardworking. Like all of these things are, are little, you know, pieces of information that are immediately gonna fall into place for a reader. And all I've told them is that they're a teacher. That's the only piece of information that I've shared. Yeah. And so it's not only can jobs kind of kickstart that get to know the character um, thing that we want to do to, to create that empathy link. Um, it can also, you know, shed light on what the character's goals are. Um, you know, maybe the thing that they want or they need has to do with their job or maybe their job is holding them back in some way. And so in order for them to get what they really want, they have to let go of this job or the idea of what this job is, break through a glass ceiling, whatever it is, and move on to something else. Um, so it can fit into their character arc, it can fit into the plot line, it can create conflict. I mean, think about, sorry, I know I'm nerding out a little bit here. I get all excited about this stuff, but- Oh, I um, love it. The whole idea of using an occupation to build in Conf plot conflict is is brilliant yeah there's yeah, so much i mean that. just just think about us working from home right you know all of us to some degree over covid if you didn't before you work from home now and so you've got your work life and your personal life clashing and there can be a lot of friction there if you've got kids if you've got a spouse who you know resents the amount of time that you're working or you're trying to share the same common area or you know everybody needs the computer at the same time or you know you've got clients coming in and out of the house like there's just so many different ways where blending your personal life and your professional life can cause a lot of problems for us and so we can apply that to our characters and think about you know in my character situation what could go wrong i mean we've all you know seen news where people are zooming and, you know, somebody's walking in the background or someone's getting changed or, you know, like all kinds of stuff that can happen. Yeah. So, you know, we can have a lot of fun with it and think about how can we, you know, you know, how can we use our character's occupation to pressure them and, and just really reveal who they are and yeah, how I they love, behave with other people. I love the idea, too, that occupations carry with them. Um, certain like stereotype stereotypical personalities or assumptions where it's because mm -hmm. I, you know as somebody who's changed occupations a lot in life you know just I've never thought of it before but just the idea of taking a, a character from one occupation to another contrasting occupation just sets up some really fantastic conflict right off the right off the bat mm -hmm. I'm talking about it's really fantastic yeah. yeah I love that yeah um so you mentioned um earlier that you have a partner um and so i didn't prep you for this question so if you just want to punt it and be like i don't want to talk about that um i apologize but i know that having long-lasting partnerships in the author world is really can be really difficult um would you mind talking a little bit about 
uh, what it is that's keeping your partnership going and kind of like, cause y'all have this, and I'm going to, I'm going to start asking you about the website in a second because the websites, I was looking at it this week. It's really amazing. Uh, but before we get to that, talk to us a little bit about what you guys are doing to keep uh, in this like crazy author world where, you know, things are high, emotions are always high. What are you guys doing to make the partnership uh, work well? Well, you know, I'm, I am so unbelievably lucky because um, Becca Puglisi, who's my, she's my co-author and then she's my business partner in the different businesses that we have. Um, her and I just work so well together. Um, we, we, we definitely, you know, there, we don't see eye to eye on everything, just like any relationship, but we find that each one of us we complement the other strengths and weaknesses. So areas where I'm strong, you know, are areas where maybe, you know, she's not as comfortable or she's not as proficient. And then things that I, you know, I'm not good at, or I don't like to do, she's really good at, and uh, she's very proficient in. So that really helps the fact that um, we're so complementary um, with our strengths. It makes it really easy for us to work on projects together. I think too, we have, we have a lot of the same ideas when it comes to writing, what's important um, for storytelling and what makes a really strong story and a strong character. And so because we have the same sort of ideas, um, it's very easy for our writing styles to mesh. When we write a book, you know, we will figure out the out outline of it. We'll, we'll do all the entries. So if they're emotions or settings or personality traits or whatever they are, we'll kind of go through all of those by splitting them in half. Uh, whichever subjects we decide to tackle, we kind of split the lists in half, we each do our halves, and then we trade, you know, and then we kind of fill in the blanks ideas that I might have about her entries and vice versa, you know, it just rounds everything out. And then when we, we do all the teaching content that kind of starts every book off all the how to stuff, you know, again, we will decide like, okay, what's the most important stuff that people need to know about emotion. And then, you know, we sort of will outline what that's going to look like. We split it in half. We each do half. We swap. And so at the end of it, you can't really, you couldn't look at something and say, oh, well, Angela wrote this section and Becca wrote that. Like you wouldn't be able to tell because our styles have just blended so well at that point in time. I think another reason why we work well together is because we found each other early on in our writing career. And so we studied writing together by reading the same books. Um, we, for a year, what we decided to do was actually set writing aside for the most part and just read writing craft books. And so we would read the same one at the same time and then we would discuss it. And if there was something that I didn't quite get, chances are Becca understood it really well or vice versa again. So we sort of helped each other grow and we kind of grew in the same direction. So That's that has cool. made it really well. Yeah, but, so I'm hearing you say that like, I, you know, you kind of hit on three things there that I think is really interesting. The, the idea that um, you, you kind of started at the same level and have grown into the same maturity level, um, mm -hmm. that uh, you aren't afraid to share your work with each other. And it doesn't sound like there's a lot of like competitiveness over like whose voice is here and whose voice, but that like you're able just to like kind of sacrifice the individual desire in order to like um build the um build the like the work comes before your own personal ego mm -hmm. that's what i was trying to get to uh and then that idea that um you're both invested in the work together and you're both working and you both have this common shared vision i know there's a lot of authors yeah. that like are looking to model successful partnerships so you know that's kind of what i was hearing when you were talking it, it's really uh really sounds like a great relationship y'all have you going. have to it's really fantastic. trust each other and you know you have to have the same work ethic you have to you know be able to compromise be able to come to you know there's certain things that maybe we don't feel exactly the same on it and so we or we have different ideas and we have to come to a consensus but you know we're always able to talk things out and we keep ego out of it um you know there's just there's no room for that in a successful partnership yeah. And I think too, a division of labor, like understanding who's good at what, and then splitting that out is really important because you're looking at two aspects, not just writing the product, but also the business side of things, the marketing, all that kind of stuff. So you have to make sure that, you know, you're both, 
putting in the work it may be in different ways if you have different skill sets and stuff like that but. yeah that complementing strengths you have going is really fantastic yeah That's yeah i'm awesome. very lucky very lucky yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to jump back to this, the sources for a second now that I've distracted us. Um, so there's the emotional thesaurus, the urban um, urban setting, rural setting, um, character traits, positive and negative, occupational thesaurus, and amplifiers. Um, and I'm probably and emotional missing. wounds too. Emotional, emotional wounds. Thank you. Yeah. I knew I was missing one. <laughs> um, so which of those is this is i know a weird off the beat question but which of those was your favorite to write this is like sophie's choice you know <laughs> and they're you all only could keep one baby they're all on the shelf watching me so um i i would probably say i kind of have well uh, i have lots of favorites for different reasons but probably i would say the emotion the source you know kind of started everything for us and open yeah. this cool gateway to creating these tools that are helping so many writers. And like, you know, talking again about Becca and I, uh, we're both a hundred percent, like all about our brand, which is writers helping writers. And so being able to help writers all over the world with like this big problem of, you know, trying to figure out how to write powerful fiction, like it's just so rewarding. And so I would say the emotion to source, you know, really, I love that book because it kind of started everything and helped us understand ourselves a little bit better. Um, yeah. But yeah, they're all good for different reasons. Even the emotional wound to source, which was the hardest to write because it's so dark and you have to, you know, we had to research a lot into like real world trauma, but we're really That's proud tough. of that one because it, it is, it goes, you know, really deep into some, you know, awful traumatic situations and the reality is is that the emotional wounds will be at the heart of every character arc so understanding what they are you know helps writers understand what they need to overcome in order to you know achieve whatever is important to them so it's it was a hard book to write but really satisfying one i think for both of us that's very cool sorry janet i'm pausing to make sure you don't want to jump in because you know i'll just talk over everybody um so let's say an author is coming to you're they're listening to this so like man i'm writing characters and i'm struggling to get that like diverse voice out of characters i'm struggling to like all my characters have the same emotional wound and that's like getting old how would you recommend a writer start with one of your thesauruses um i would definitely suggest to read the how-to content first because I think what happens with a lot of writers is they hear, you know, they hear about this thing called the thesaurus and especially the emotion thesaurus. They hear, oh, there's this thing. It's so helpful. It's the emotion thesaurus. And they jump right to the entries. And, you know, when you jump right to the entries, if you don't understand how to apply the information that you're seeing, you're really going to only get a small amount of value from it. You'd get a lot more if you actually read, like, why is this information really important? How do I use it in the story? I think with the emotion thesaurus, there can be a misconception that it's a cut and paste tool. And, you know, this again is unfortunate because that's not what it is at all. It's rather, it's a brainstorming list of things for you to take, you know, your character that you know better than everyone, you know, and think about what would my character do in this situation and just go through that list and listen to your gut as to, oh, I could totally see my character doing that in this scene that I'm going to use it. You know, the, the options that are in the emotion thesaurus are, are, are purposely, you know, um, brought down to its core essence so that it can be adapted and rewritten in a way that's fresh. You know, it's not a cut and paste tool. If you just cut and paste, you know, shrugging, it's not, that's not compelling. That's not, you know, um, evoking any emotions in the reader. And so I would say definitely to read all the front matter because then you have a really good condensed understanding of what the topic is and then you you're going to go into those entries and have a better understanding of how you can apply this to your story whatever the topic is i love that i love the idea of like using it as a as a brainstorming tool that allows you to dig deeper into your characterization and really build out that character which mm -hmm. i guess we talk a lot on the podcast about um you building what we call a character wheel chart where you're like you're modulating emotion 
uh, based on or modulating a character's voice based on what's going on. And I, I use the emotional thesaurus a lot to build my chart because I'll be like, OK, I know my character in the book is going to experience fear. So what are some ways that I can like shape that voice? And it, it's a, such a great brainstorming tool for that because it allows me to like um, instead of having to come up with all these things by myself to be able to like use yeah. it as a reference and dive into it and be like, OK, how can I shape the character's voice around this? this aspect of their response to, you know, celebration or their response to, um, you know, uh, vulnerability or like these different things that they might experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Jeanette, before I jump into talking about the website, any questions you want to ask about the thesaurus or mm -hmm. using the thesaurus? That's the one I use the most. And so I'm just wondering if you had any tips with, if you're, for people who are trying to portray mixed emotions or conflicted emotions. Um. Well, first of all, there is an emotion in the book for conflicted. So you can start there if you have it. But if you don't, whatever your character is feeling, I mean, the hard part about emotion is that our characters annoyingly don't ever feel one emotion at a time, right? They feel like a whole bunch at the same time. And so it can be difficult to articulate that without feeling like, am I confusing the reader? You know, is, are they happy or are they upset or, you know, are they anxious? And when they're feeling all these things, it can be difficult. So what can help in that case where you have like a, you know, your character has mixed emotions about something, mixed feelings is to think about what those two feelings are, first of all, but also think about the logical process of the, the way that they're thinking about something. So if your character, let's say, is start with whatever the root emotion is, like whatever the, the emotion that kind of triggers everything and start there and describe that. So if you think about a character um, who they just buy a brand new car, you know, it's, a, it's like their first sports car. They're so excited. They're just drying off a lot, you know, the tops down. They're just like, yeah, I feel so good. You know, like they're just pumped. And they're thinking about, oh my God, I can't wait till my friends see this car. It's like so amazing. You know, and they're going along and the foot's, you know, going down on the gas pedal and they got the radio going and then someone like right in front of them, like swerves right in front of them. And then they slam on the brakes and their heart is pounding and they're thinking, oh my gosh, like I almost got into an accident. And then all of a sudden they're thinking, holy cow, like if I got into an accident, like I totally overextended myself with this car. Like I can't afford to fix it. I can't afford the insurance. You know, what? did I make a mistake here? Like, did I, maybe I shouldn't have done this. Like maybe I shouldn't have got this car. I should have got something a little less expensive to have, give myself a buffer. So showing that thought process of where your character starts and then what is the catalyst for that mixed feeling, right? That kind of zigzags into this feeling and then zigzags over here and just show that process to the character's thoughts is one way that can really help readers kind of follow along and follow the trail of these mixed emotions. But also think about what we do when we're unsure of something. Um, and that's really what we wanna do whenever we're thinking about emotion is think about what we do as people because we wanna bring the real world into our story, especially through our characters, especially through their behavioral responses. And so when we're unsure about stuff, we're kind of non-committal. We, um, you know, we'll hesitate, we'll interrupt ourselves, you know, you, you'll pause. Um, you're going to have sort of, you're going to disengage maybe from conversations um, in your mind. If it's the point of view character, you know, they're going to analyze things. They're going to think about the pros and the cons or the positives and the negatives or the good and bad of whatever these conflicting emotions are. Because at the end of the day, you know, they're probably wrestling with a decision of some kind, you know, they're trying to figure out what to do next or, you know, um, which option to take or how to read something. And they're gonna overthink stuff. Um, if that's your character's tendency, maybe your character, you know, personality will come into it too. And if your character feels really uncomfortable with mixed emotions, they might just back away completely and completely disengage from the situation, you know, or they may just like barrel ahead and just, you know, try not to let their emotions overwhelm them and just uh, lead with action. And then maybe they make lots of mistakes as a result of that. So some of it will be kind of dependent on who your character is and um, their emotional range. And I think this emotional range is kind of what you were talking about with your wheel, with your dialogue wheel is thinking about, you know, what are my character's typical behaviors and what is their go-to range for different things? You know, 
Yeah. Um, when, when you think about emotions like fear, everybody's going to have different responses to what makes them scared and your, your characters will too. Um, and especially if they're dealing with emotions that are sensitive, you know, they're going to be more emotionally volatile. And so maybe you can bring that in as well. And I love what you're saying about making the emotional expression true to the characterization right? Like the character, the, how the character expresses, you know, like you're saying, an analytical character thinking things through and actively thinking things through, demonstrating that to the author, uh, to the reader, instead of saying like, my character is analytic, like Jimmy's analytic, mm -hmm. so he thinks things through, instead like demonstrating that process shows that like emotion, like you were saying earlier on in the interview, that like showing instead of telling by yeah. displaying the emotion. Um, I also love what you're saying about the transitions between emotions and thinking about how you transition between emotions and then trying to replicate that. Like your car example is so great because there is that like immediate transition of emotion that's going to feel sudden and jerky and terrifying. And there's going to be like a quick shift in how things are looking. But then the aftermath of that, I know for me and for most people, like a heightened emotional change like that doesn't switch back right away. Mm -hmm. Like we're not a switch you flip on and off. So if you have like a jump scare like that, it takes a while to come down. So like showing that modulation through the progression of emotion yeah. uh, post that kind of jump scare can really create that like authentic and realistic experience for the reader with your character, which, mm -hmm. yeah, I just, I love that the illustration you're using because I think it illustrates that really well. Uh, yeah, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Did that uh, answer your question, Jeanette? Yeah, no, that was great. Okay. Um, okay, so talk to us about, you've got an online platform going called One Stop for Writers, which um, is uh, amazing. I was playing around with it. Uh, confession, amazingly uh, easy to use and like very self-explanatory and also super comprehensive. So um, just for people who aren't uh, aware of it, talk about, talk to us about it a little bit and kind of how you hope authors are going to use that subscription service. Well, one thing to know about Beck and I, and you probably kind of know it from our books, is that we like to think outside the box. So our mission is how can we help writers and how can we help writers in a way that maybe they aren't being helped now? And, you know, that's sort of the idea where all these, the, th the source guides came from is that, you know, we wanted to help people in a new way. And so we created something that's kind of a hybrid tool slash uh, writing guide to do so. And uh, the thing is though, is that Becca and I, we, we do like to think creatively and we have a lot of ideas for other tools that maybe we wish existed and don't. And uh, so, you know, we decided to start building some of these things. And so One Stop for Writers is a place where Beck and I, it's kind of our mental playground where we get to exercise our, our ideas and think about how we can make storytelling easier for writers. Um, because there is like a lot to it. You know, it's the more you know about storytelling, the more it's like, holy cow, there's like a lot to juggle. You know, when you think about your characters and their motivation and their needs and their desires and their emotional wounds, and it's like, there's a lot. And so we want to demystify as much as we can, whether it's story structure or character building, or just the aspect of what show don't tell really is, and how to find you know, the right words to use that are going to push that story forward, characterize your story's cast, um, you know, symbolize something so that there's a deeper, something more meaningful happening in the scene, whatever it is, we want to help writers do that. And so that's what we do at One Stop. Um, like I said, we have um, eight different writing guides, but at One Stop, we have, I think, I think there's 15 different thesauruses now. And there's another one we'll be releasing soon in a couple months, the Conflict Thesaurus. And then there's one that we're working on right now called the Relationship Thesaurus. Oh, awesome. And so it's like a giant database of information on a lot of it has to do with characters, but also just how to enrich your scenes and your storytelling. And so if you need ideas for, uh, for example, your character's arc. We have a thesaurus there called the Character Motivation Thesaurus that looks at the inner and outer conflict, the inner and outer um, motivation that your character has. And we've looked at 
the most common um, storylines that you'll find in fiction and film. So the most common motivations that characters might have, everything from like finding love to getting revenge, all different kinds of things, and then breaking that down as to what that could look like in someone's story. And so if you're struggling with plotting, if you're trying to understand character arc, just looking at that particular thesaurus can really help you build your entire story. Um, the other thing that we do at One Stop is that we're starting to build hyper-intelligent tools that use the thesaurus database um, as its information source. And so the one tool that specifically I, I, I would love to talk about is, it's called the Character Builder Tool, and I don't know if you played with it at all, but the Character Builder Tool leads a person through all the aspects of character planning. Um, everything from understanding their backstory and looking at their character's emotional wounds and the different fears that they have, the different lies that they believe as a result of that emotional wound, the different secrets that they have um, to their behavior, their emotional range, um, different triggers that they might have, different emotional sensitivities. Mm. Um, it looks at their physicality, their talents, their skills, occupations, basically any, any window that we have two different thesauruses, it pulls that information in. So if you were building a character, um, when you go to plan what your character's emotional wounds are, you can literally select an emotional wound and then from that wound, select behaviors. So just like you would use one of these writing guides, you can actually select the different behaviors or the different options that fit that particular character that you think are gonna wow. work. And the best thing about the character builder tool is that it's hyper intelligent in that we created it so that it um, recognizes key bits of information that you choose that will factor into the character's arc. And so nice. it will build a character arc blueprint for you based on, you know, your character's flaws, your character's goal, um, what's holding them back, the emotional wound. And it will actually show you, you know, what your character's trying to do, what's at stake, you know, what is going to keep them from succeeding? What do they have to overcome? And it becomes this great little thing to help you plot your story. That's and awesome. so, yeah, it's just, it's a lot of fun. And, and it, um, it really allows you to go deep because one thing that is behind everything we've talked about today is that if we want to really write compelling characters and compelling emotion, we have to understand who our characters are. Mm -hmm. um, if we don't understand who they are and their personality and their, past experiences and everything that makes them who they are, then they are going to all sound the same on the page. You know, they are going to have all the same responses. Each one of us, we all grew up differently. We had different things happen to us, good and bad. They shaped who we are and our characters will be the same way. So again, this is what I talk about bringing the real world into storytelling by making characters who are really like real people. It pays off so much because we'll understand their behavior, we'll understand how they respond in different circumstances, we will know what their emotional sensitivities and their triggers are, and we will trigger them, you know, well, we'll know all that kind of stuff. And for dialogue, it's going to pay off in that your characters are going to sound different on the page, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're all, they'll all have different voices, they'll all sound different. Like, um, we talk about on the podcast a lot, how, you know, we think of character voice like a daisy, where there's like the root system is the character background and the character, like the emotional wounds that were caused and the place and culture and all that kind of stuff. And then the stem is the personality that has kind of grown out of those roots. And then the blossom is the character voice. That's the actual like expression of that personality. Mm -hmm. um, so just the thing, I love that you're creating this tool that like allows um, some aid in like building that picture of a character because it all it's just going to lead to more diverse characters. It's like um, I used to, so I had a brief stint in life uh it, when i was in college i took my dad died i took some time off and uh, i got this weird job as a blacksmith's assistant and oh, wow. yeah it was really strange i worked for the oldest still functioning black shop in the country it was g krug and sons in downtown baltimore and my job was i'd get on this truck with this guy kevin who's fantastic and he would um he and i would go to the shop and we'd load the shop up with all kinds of like windows uh window grates and railings and gates and all this stuff that had to be installed and we'd drive all over the city installing this stuff and his truck was crazy it had like five toolboxes on it and there were like 
a thousand tools in this thing and we'd get to a job and he'd be like i need you to go to like the third drawer and pull it out and look all the way in the back and there's going to be this really funky wrench would you get that wrench and grab it and bring it over and i'd bring the wrench over and he'd like tweak this thing one time and it would be perfectly fixed it was like what <laughs> that was like the perfect tool for this moment and so i say that to share like i know a lot of times when authors we hear about smart tools and we hear about like these things that can help us like create like your building that can help us create characters that are this resource a lot of times we have this like I know I do this like internal curmudgeon who's like, you know, well, I don't need that. I'm a writer. I'm going to do it the hard way in a log cabin with a candle by myself. <laughs> and that's going to make me a real writer. But like Kevin used to tell me all the time, right? Like the point is not that it's hard. The point is to get the job done, to write the story that you're trying to get out of your head. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of get as many tools in your truck as you possibly can so that as you like, are doing this job, th you're not like suffering through these things that these smart tools like you're creating can help you with. So I think it's a, I'm super excited about your character builder. I'm totally gonna go play with it because it sounds a lot of fun. It is fun, it is fun. But you've touched on a really important thing and, and, and that is that, you know, like, as we all know, there's big learning curve to writing. And we do run across some people that they're like, Angela, if I use the emotion thesaurus, isn't that cheating? You yeah. know, and it's like, no, it's not cheating. Like, it's just oh, so I'm like, yes, it's brain, cheating. Right? cheat all day. There's no rules. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I mean, the, you know, there. yeah. So, you know, it isn't, it isn't cheating. It's just simply understanding that, you know, there's a lot to manage as a writer. And if there's things that can help us learn more quickly, um, getting information in different ways help us helps us grow our writing craft and grows our understanding of storytelling. And so, you know, it's I say if it if it works for you, then use it. Um, what we try to do at one stop is make sure that that our users are learning as they're going. So we we break down some of these more complex things that you have to understand about your character or about your plot, but we we educate as we go along. And there's different tutorials and stuff like that that you can take so that as you're using these things, you're understanding why these things are important. And it's, you're gonna become a stronger writer, not because you're using a tool that's making the job easier, mm -hmm. but because you're actually understanding, okay, this is why the fatal flaw is like really important. Now I know this, you know, or yeah. that's how that works in character arc. You, you kind of gain a new understanding um, for different pieces of the puzzle. Yeah, and if you have some kind of weird pleasure out of having to suffer through mastering something that a tool can help you with. You know, like <laughs> if you really need to build an entire house just using hammer and nails, like feel free, but there's also a nail gun and all and levels and thousands of fabulous tools that you can grab to help you build that house a lot faster and a lot quicker um, that you'll still learn from using. So yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's- Everybody's gotta find their own path. So it's all yeah. good. Yeah. Um, all right, Jeanette, uh, any other questions you want to ask? We're running short on time, so I'm... I do have a question. Yeah. Um, I went and saw a talk that you gave in 2017, and at the time you were commenting on how you didn't get a chance to write fiction anymore, so I'm just curious if you've found any time since. <laughs> I have not. <laughs> um, like I said, this, uh, this unexpected uh, career path has uh, really... It's been incredibly rewarding to be able to help writers. I, you know, I can't underscore how fantastic it is to do something that, you know, you get to help people because that's really a big part of who I am and a big part of who Becca is. So we get a lot of, you know, joy out of that, but it's a lot of work between, you know, running one stop, her and I, um, you know, and then all the books and then the speaking that we do, you know, it's it's a lot. And uh, we also have writers helping writers that we have, which is a incredibly, you know, uh, popular site for writers. Mm -hmm. And so there has not been any chance for us to get back to writing. It's still on my radar, though. And my hope is, is that, you know, kind of as we grow a little bit, we can bring other people on to sort of help share the load. And then, um, you know, there'll be a little bit more time for writing. So yeah, not yet. But I hope. I have to give it up. It's going to happen. And I know so much more now about writing. So I'm kind of excited to see what I write. I may not even write in the same genre anymore. I don't know. 
um, and what it'll look like. I'm kind of excited about that. So that's awesome. It's really fantastic. Um, Angela, so we know uh, authors can find you at Writers Helping Writers and at One Stop. Um, is there any other place where you want people to come look for you or find you? Um, I'm, I'm on a lot of social media. So nice. if you like, if you like Twitter or you like Facebook, um, I'm on those, I'm on Instagram. I mean, I, I probably am on, um, if you, for personal stuff and just chit chat and stuff like that, Facebook's probably the place to find me most for that. I tend to share a lot of content on Twitter. Um, you know, just a lot of helpful articles and different nice. things that I find. I like to share that on Twitter, but definitely Facebook is a really good place to kind of get to get to know me a little bit better. Awesome. So. That's fantastic. All right. We'll come find you. Um, I'm going to stop the recording. We can talk a little bit more, but sure thanks thing. so much for coming on oh, today. This was fantastic. Thank you.